Well, let's bow together in a word of prayer tonight as we get started. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together again here this evening, and I ask that you would bless this time, that you would build us up in your word, that you would give us understanding from it as we continue on in First Peter this evening. Help me to preach your word faithfully. It's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, over the last couple of sermons, we have seen the commands given to us by God that we are to live holy, that we are to guard our minds according to His Word, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is going to judge us. And now, as I said before, the reality of that transformed life, of the new living, it is based upon the work of Christ in giving us salvation, that we are to live holy because it is the Lord who has redeemed us, who has sanctified us and set us apart. Uh, this evening, we're going to see these particular themes continue in First Peter with a primary emphasis upon truth and love. One of the great aspects of the last part of the first chapter here is the command to love one another. In recent days, our culture has used the quote-unquote love of neighbor argument in a wide variety of ways. One of which is to say that out of love, we should show what is known as pronoun hospitality towards others who are actually living a lie. In other words, if a woman wants us to call her a man, then we should deny reality and call her a man. Just say that she is a man and you will not be counted as a heretic by our society. The proclamation of the culture is that if you want to be loving and not considered hateful, then you need to just go along with this lie and exercise this concept known as pronoun hospitality. But there is a fundamental flaw in this line of thinking, probably many fundamental flaws that we could go into, but primarily it ties love to lies instead of truth. The idea is that in order to love your neighbor, you must go ahead and spur them on in the lie that they are believing. I love how Dr. Owen Strand puts this. He says, so-called pronoun hospitality was an early form of the love your neighbor by doing whatever they want idea. Like elements of the health mandate, such a deeply problematic strategy for neighbor love calls Christians to keep the second commandment by breaking the first commandment. This reveals how unsound such an emphasis is in fundamental terms. Uh, the reason is, is because God is the one who defines love, not man. And so biblically speaking, truth and love are closely connected together. They are not at odds with one another in any way, rather they work together in unison. Therefore, going along with someone who is acting as though they are a man when they are a woman runs contrary to the truth of God. Not only that, but it would be unloving towards that person, not only towards God, but towards that person for us to affirm that lie because we're encouraging them in their sin. Because once you believe that it is God who defines truth and it is God who defines love, you see that these two never oppose each other. Because God does not contradict himself. If you are to love your neighbor, you must encourage them in the truth. We do that with grace. We do that out of hearts of full of humility. But we absolutely take firm, bold stands upon the truth. That is, in and of itself, loving. I give that example because what we're going to see here in First Peter tonight is the importance of truth and the importance of love. They are bound together, and as born-again Christians, we are obligated to understand that fact. And so let's dive in here. First Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass wither, but the flower and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The purification of the Christian through the truth of the gospel message and the entirety of biblical truth is the foundation for love. 
If you want to be a loving individual, you must come to a deep understanding of the truth of God, of the truth of the Scripture. It is transforming. It will transform you to be more like Christ, who was himself the most loving individual. Uh, sometimes we can get in our minds that if we elevate truth, if we elevate doctrine and theology as Christians, uh, then the result is that we will become all stuffy, uh, simply seeking to somehow be intellectual but never loving others. If you, certain, if you follow specific theological circles, you'll hear that sort of a thing all the time. However, in reality, the higher the truth, the higher the doctrine in the local church, the higher the amount of love that should be present. I can honestly, honestly say that this biblical truth is what I have personally seen and experienced in my own life. Uh, that the churches that are the most faithful to the gospel, that are the most faithful to the scripture, they tend to be the most loving and caring ones as well. And that is because of this principle that we see here in the book of First Peter. That it is based on the truth of the gospel message that we are actually called to love. Uh, because God has loved us, because Christ Christ has come to die for us. We are now to love other individuals. Far from being opposed to love, truth is the foundation for love. And notice that verse 22, it discusses our obedience to the truth also. Uh, that part is critical. It's not just that we heard the truth of the gospel, it's that we actually heard and obeyed the truth of the gospel. Now, the gospel commands us to repent. It commands us to bow before Jesus, clinging to him as the only Lord and Savior. Uh, there is a fundamental distinction between those who merely hear the gospel as opposed to those who actually hear and obey it. One group is damned and the other is saved because it is faith in Christ. Christ that saves. And that is why the gospel commands faith and repentance. Uh, Peter is addressing here those who not only have heard the gospel message, but those who have actually submitted to Christ as Lord. He's talking to those who truly know the Lord Jesus. And it is critical that we obey the truth of God and submit to it. It is this bowing before the truth of Christ, the gospel message, and the scripture that produces the brotherly love that this verse talks about. And we need to be clear here, as a note of clarification, that unbelievers can and do demonstrate acts of love. You can look at an unbelieving wife and husband, and you can see that they do love one another. However, what you do not see is a foundation, a belief system, that will support such acts of love that you see by unbelievers. It is a common grace gift of God that unbelievers can perform acts of love, that they can even perform acts of sacrifice on the behalf of others. Yet, because they reject God, they would not have any theological basis for doing so. Even in their acts of love, however, it's not this genuine, deep love that is produced by the gospel message. Because once you have been transformed by Christ, it completely changes your perspective. You realize that the God of the universe has looked upon you. He has looked upon you who, were a, who was a sinner, and he has chosen to love you in Christ. Uh, there is none who can do anything worse to you or to I than what we have already done to the perfect and holy God of the universe. And yet he has loved us as believers. Therefore, on that basis, we are to go out and we are to show love to others. Uh, within the context here, the primary focus is upon loving other Christians. It is calling us to sincere brotherly love. Now, often during periods of trials and suffering, it can be tempting for the church to fracture in certain ways. Because of all the hostility going on, we can get caught up in our emotions and begin to treat others, and specifically those who are close around us, in a less than loving way. But Peter here is fundamentally calling us to go down a different path, a path that says that we will love one another, and that even if the days are difficult, we will still press on and we will exhibit this Christian characteristic of biblical love, that instead of being pushed away from our 
our, biblical, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are actually drawn together. We are drawn together in Christ because we are all committed to Him. We are committed to the same Lord. We are committed to the same Scripture. And these realities are to draw us to one another. And we know that we are called to exhibit this love. And so we do seek to love one another, even in the midst of difficult times. The fact that this is a brotherly love, as the text says, it demonstrates just how close this love actually is. The love of the church should literally be like a family loving one another. Church families should be the place where you go not only to celebrate the joyous times, the good times, but also where you can go to discuss the bad and the difficult times where you can go to for help during the periods of strife and turmoil that are present in life. And this all springs up from the well of the gospel itself. But we see more about this love at the end of verse 22. We love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And I want you to notice how this is a command from the Apostle Peter. Uh, that this is coming across as he is commanding the church to do this. The command is given on the basis of the gospel itself. And that's interesting to note because if it is a command, then this is something that we are called to do whether we feel like it or not. In other words, Christian love between believers is not a negotiable aspect of biblical practice. Those who say, I love Jesus, but I don't love other Christians, are in reality slapping Christ right in the face. It would be like telling a husband, I love you, but I don't love your wife. And I don't think he's going to take it very well. It's not that we won't be sinned against in the church. You and I will be sinned against even in the church. And it is true that we will also sin against others. That's part of living in a fallen world. However, when that happens, we still make the choice to love one another by confessing our own sins and confronting the erring brother about his sin as needed. That's why you have the entire church discipline process laid out in Matthew chapter 18. But what Christian love does not do is to look at a brother and say, I'm out of here as soon as you demonstrate any sort of imperfections at all. If that were the case, all of us would be in a very, very bad position. And Peter is wanting us to demonstrate something higher in the life of the church. You see, love, it's not just an emotion that you feel. It's the decision to love someone. Now, that's why a husband and wife say, I do at the altar and not I might if I feel like it. So also in our Christian life, yeah, we must seek to invest in one another to help, believer, to help our fellow believers, to love them in Christ. It's a process of seeking to help them grow and to mature in the Lord and trying to help one another through all of the ups and downs of life. And notice how this love is described. First, the word earnestly here is used in this passage. Uh, this has the idea of loving someone intently, of loving another individual fervently. In other words, this type of love does not exhibit any sort of lukewarm behavior. Now, this is a passionate love willing to sacrifice for the good of another individual. The idea is that we care so deeply about our brothers and sisters uh, that we love with a great passion in Christ. And it is also said that this love stems from a pure heart. Uh, the word pure here is actually often translated as clean. It makes sense that we who have been purified, we who have been made righteous in Christ, would demonstrate a clean love, a pure love. Uh, we all have known individuals who seem as though they are simply seeking to curry favor with someone uh, so that they can gain something out of that individual. In other words, they're simply being nice to the person for their own selfish reasons. In contrast, Christian love is pure. There is no contamination from sin or evil in it. There's not supposed to be. The idea here is that we are not seeking our own.
own benefit. But instead, we are willing to love even to the point of detriment, even to the point of sacrifice to our own selves. Uh, that if it costs you time, possessions, or energy, you are willing to go the extra mile for your brother. Uh, the concept is that you and I are willing to be used, to be poured out for the glory of God unto the service of others. Uh, that we are using our lives as offerings of praise for his glory. And all of this stems from the pure heart given by the gospel, given by the power of Christ. It's all because of what he has done for us. Christ died. He gave himself, and we are to follow that example. Now notice verse 23. He continues expressing the reason for this love. Since you have been born again... Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Uh, this is, again, the basis for the love that we are to show one another. The fact that we are born again through the power of the gospel. This is not a momentary concept. This is an eternal reality. It is not an is not a perishable seed. The seed of the gospel will not be destroyed. That once you have placed faith in Christ, that is an eternal reality. And so you and I should always be producing fruit for his sake. The concept is that one who has been so changed, one who has been so transformed by the power of Christ, by the eternal work of God, uh, the idea is how could our hearts not overflow with love towards others because of our love for God uh, that is centered around the truth. This is what we're being called to live out. And you'll notice that the imperishable the seed, the seed here is described as the word of God. The Holy Spirit uses the saving message, the Word of God, to raise us into this new life. That this is all bringing us back to the gospel. And it brings us back to this tie between love and truth. Because if you do not have a true gospel, if you don't have a true belief in the scripture, and then Peter's entire line of argumentation falls apart in this passage. And notice that the word here is described as living and abiding. Now, I think that this text is clearly primarily talking about the gospel, but it does have an eye on the scripture as a whole here as well. As we'll see here in a minute, Peter quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. And in that passage, the teaching of Scripture is clearly in view. And so whenever we read this part about the living and abiding part, we need to think in terms of the Scripture and specifically the saving message of the Bible. Uh, since God's Word is living and abiding, that means that it is alive within us, uh, that we are called to store in our minds uh, so that we may remember it, so that it may come to our memory to serve us, to spur us on, that we may know how we are called to live. It is abiding in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes to our minds many times just when we need it to understand what God would have of us in a certain situation. Uh, this can be said of no other book or message that it is living and abiding. It is only about the special revelation of God, the Scripture, that this could be said. And it shows us something of the power of God's Word itself. That this is a living weapon with abiding energy and power to destroy the strongholds of those who oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has the power to destroy the strongholds of sin. Uh, the, the areas of sin in our life that we are still seeking to grow in in sanctification. Christ saves us by this power. And he sanctifies us through the abiding word, that we may know how to live before him as obedient servants. Now look at how this train of thought continues in verses 24 and 25. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Now, this is the part I was referencing earlier that is from Isaiah chapter 40. The context in Isaiah is actually very interesting where this passage arises. It comes on the heels of some devastating news for the Israelites uh, that they have just been told about the judgment of God, about the Babylonian captivity. 
And in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, I'm not going to read it tonight, but I would definitely urge you to study that section of Scripture. But in the opening, in the opening verses of the 40th chapter, Isaiah is given the command to speak words of comfort to the people here after Isaiah 39 and this message of judgment have come. And over the next few chapters, several chapters, what you see is some of the most intense and powerful prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. Some of those we've been reading on Sunday mornings to open our, pass open our services. However, one of the things that Isaiah speaks about after being told to give a message of comfort is he speaks about the Word of God. Now, do you think that Peter is drawing from that passage for a specific reason. Think about it for a second. The saints to whom Peter is writing, they were in a difficult situation. We've talked about the persecution and the suffering that they were facing. And the Old Testament believers to whom Isaiah was addressing were also in a difficult spot just having received this message. And in both cases, the power and the might of the Word of God is being discussed. And I don't think that's a coincidence, that this is the foundation for hope for us as Christians. Because the world's ideas, the world's standards change all the time. But you and I don't have to get up tomorrow and wonder, what are we going to believe? Because it's already been written in the Scripture. We don't have to get up tomorrow wondering what does it look like for us to love others. We have the sufficient word to guide and to direct us. We don't have to be feverishly wondering how can we be saved because the gospel message has already been written in the blood of Christ. And undoubtedly, this is a great assurance. That whether you are an Israelite in Babylonian captivity or you are a New Testament believer looking at persecution facing you. The stability of the Word of God is the foundation for your hope. You know that what God has said will come to pass. You can look at the Scripture and note that despite of all the craziness of the world that you and I see around us, we know God has spoken in the Scripture and His kingdom has the victory. In contrast to our frail flesh, in contrast to the grass of the field, which is a living picture right now, is very much dead, at least in my yard. In contrast, the Word of God does not fade away. It will not be here one day and gone the next. No, it abides eternally. It abides everlastingly as the written revelation of God. And so Peter closes this section by reminding the believers that, of the message that this is the message that he has preached to them. This is the foundation for their belief. This is the foundation for their hope and their love. It is the truth of God. And in this text, it is a powerful exhortation to us to keep on living as faithful believers, loving one another even in the midst of times of hostility, to keep living according to the standard of God, the Bible. Like we discussed last week in the evening, that we are called to be sober-minded. Well, if we want to be stable, if we want to be steadfast, we must base our lives upon the Scripture. It is the changeless standard. Do you want to love others faithfully? Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe the saving message of the Bible and live according to its teaching. All of this is based upon the revelation of God. Our job, our duty as the church is to have a high commitment to the truth, which then changes our hearts, it changes our souls, it changes our minds, so that we are spurred on to love others, to love one another, to love God. Whatever storms went on for the Old Testament believers, whatever storms went on for the New Testament believers that Peter is writing to, they were called to this objective. And so are we also in our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer here. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study this first chapter of the book of 1 Peter together over these last few weeks. 
I ask that you would bless the rest of our study through this book. I thank you for the passage that we saw tonight and that you would help us to have a high commitment and a high understanding of the truth of your word, that this would transform us, that we may love you more and that we may love others more and go out living according to the scripture. Help us to glorify you over this next week. And it's in your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.